All right, here we go. <laughs> Paula J. Parker. Hello, Vlad. Welcome to Vlad TV. I am so honored because I get the actual you. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I've heard through the grapevine that you kind of do your interviews from a screen most times. Sometimes. So, you know, I'm glad. Yeah. I tried to get him to sit next to me, and we do it kind of Elvis Costello style. Isn't that his name, Elvis Costello? The... No, that's not his name. No. Elvis somebody or another? That was Mitchell. That was Mitchell. Elvis Mitchell, yes. Mm. So Elvis Costello must be. Okay, interviewing me, guys, is like playing charades, but we will get through this. <laughs> I think Elvis Costello is a musician. Yes. Elvis Mitchell is the interviewer right. who sits beside we, Oprah. We could even say Oprah. Yeah, you Oprah know? does so, the same thing. He's very handsome, guys. He reminds me of um, Arthur. For those of you who play RDR2, he's got the rugged beard, um, but you know, he's real, you know, sexy. Oh, oops. But you know, my husband doesn't care. I'm just being me. Um, so yeah, he reminds me of Arthur and RDR2. So yeah, when if you let his beard grow and get the tonic. Thank so, you. you know. Thank you. Well, big fan oh, for thank a very you, long time. Thank you. Seen a ton of your movies. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and you've been consistently doing it for a very long time, so congratulations. Blessed, Hollywood is a you. tough place. Yes, and that was my prayer. Yeah. To be, I I heard Sybil Shepherd say it once. You know, when you come to Hollywood, you know, pray to be a consistently working actress because, mm-hmm. you know, fame is fleeting. It comes and goes. It's like you know, it's in the wind. Whatever someone feels like feeling in that moment, but if you if you are consistent with your work, you will stay consistently working. Yep, and you've been consistently working. Well, thank you, Jesus, yes. Well, it's your first time here, so... Well, I wouldn't say consistently. There have been breaks and, you know... And we'll talk about cheerings. that. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. No regrets. I love that movie. Okay. But let's go ahead and start at the beginning. So you were born and raised in Cleveland. Yes. Midwest. Cleveland, Ohio, yes. A Midwest okay. girl. What was that like? Oh, wow. Growing up in the Midwest was really, really cool. And I would recommend it to everyone who has the opportunity. I was recently defending. We just acquired, what's that blonde hair kid for the Browns? Um, This is Forrest. He he will help me with remembering who these people are. We just acquired the blonde hair kid for the Browns. Odell Beckham. We just acquired Odell Ah, Beckham for the Browns. Right. And like the New York people are kind of mad. And I'm like, don't be mad. Because he's growing older. New York is where you learn about life, where you learn about culture. You kind of figure out who you are and where you want to be in life. And Cleveland is where you live that live that dream, live that, that reality. Because it's a lot slower. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's kids actually play outside. My son never goes outside. It's because nobody else is outside. You know, we recently went back to Cleveland just to visit. And I went to my old elementary school. And there were a pack of kids on dirt bikes just kicking it. You know, I'm from Shaker Heights, Ohio. Originally, then senior year, I moved to Cleveland Heights because, you know, I couldn't take the blatant racism, you know, in Shaker Heights that loved me and nurtured me. But then when it really came down to it, you know, I was not offered the same classes as other kids. Shaker Heights is like um, legendary. There are movies, Whoopi starred in a movie that was written about Shaker Heights. And then there's the Shaker Heights Project. You can Google it. It's when it's the first um, suburb to integrate. So they did these experiments with the kids where they would give... Half the kids um, black, blue bandanas and the other half the kids red bandanas. And then some days the kids with the blue bandanas would be ostracized and the kids with the red bandanas would be praised and then they flip it. So, you know, by the 11th grade, it was just too much because, you know, when you're teaching about racism, you're still experiencing it. And when you're the only little black girl in the class and Roots comes out, you know, how do you play a game to help everyone understand how you're learning about something that was beyond your control, just like they are, yet it's stigmatizing you, you know? So it was hard growing up in Cleveland because the Midwest is 
the middle ground. That's why I believe I have a good, you know, view on what will work in the industry and what won't because the Midwest is where elections are won. It's where, you know, I guess the Nielsen ratings are won. Mm. So we are the middle ground. In Cleveland, I I love my white boys and they love their little black sister. And you say, what's up, white boy? And he's like, what's up? You know, sis, he always say a little like sister, but he knows better than that. But, but you know, it's, it's in your face. It's not like in California where it's very undercurrent. You know, you won't get the job, but they'll pretend like it's for a reason other than what it really is. Hmm. In Cleveland, I think we're able to... You know, we we do live separate but equal, but at the same time, we are able to, you know, integrate and love each other for our differences. It's it. I can't sit here and pretend like I don't see a white boy when I'm looking at you, just like you can't pretend like you don't see a black woman, you know, a, a white man. And, you know, and it's okay mm -hmm. because I love you for your differences, you know, just like you, I'm sure, love me or I wouldn't be sitting here. So... California is different, you know. It's 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 a little undercurrent that you have to um, grow through. So, were you the only black person in your high school? No, I was the only black girl in my elementary class up through I'll say the fourth grade, and then two other little black girls came. And then it was us up until the sixth grade. Now, ahead of me was a black girl. And she was the only in her class. And her name is Lisa Boyd. She's right now a fancy um, stylist. Um, she's That's my girl. I always looked up to her. She used to wear meat coats in the sixth grade. So it was like, <laughs> yes, people work early. Yes, work those hearts early. Yeah. So um, she ended up going to Howard as well. But um, so she was the only black. So no, I wasn't the only in my school. I was the only in my class. So um, I think there were maybe three of us in elementary school um, until the other two came. And then junior high, there were a lot more, you know, black people were coming into the community a lot more. And junior high allowed different sections of Shaker Heights to all come together. Hmm. So there were a lot more black people, but I was in honors classes. So I was in honors classes because I was the only little black girl in my original, which is Sussex. I went to Sussex Elementary School. I don't know if it's still there. I don't think it's still there, but um, I went there. So because I was the only little black girl, I got to, you know, be nurtured you know, as I don't, I don't know, because at one point I became woke. I'll say like in the sixth grade, I think it's so funny that, you know, what's his name? Uh, the rapper kid gets like credited with being woke when, you know, we've been talking about being woke since the seventies, but I became woke. Um, Gambo, Gambino. Yeah. So I became woke in like the sixth grade and they showed us my, my, I remember my, it was a white teacher and she taught me about being a wasp. She wrote on the wall, I mean on the board, I am a W-A-S-P. That means white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And I had no idea what that meant or why that was pertinent. And she showed me my first images of Africans. And the images that she showed were them with no shirts on and the women were, you know, jumping around. And I was embarrassed and I laughed, you know, because, you know, I'm the only little black girl and you're going to put this on the air. Really? This is, is this, is this, it was, there was no Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So why, why is this with you, you know? So everyone was looking at me, and is that how your mama titties look? No, no one said that, but you know, I felt that, you know, so I laughed, and she pulled me in the hallway, and she cursed me out. She was like, these are your people, and I put this on for you. I put this on so that you would know and be proud of where you came from, and I'm sorry that it embarrassed you, but then you have to take a look within. So I started volunteering my time with the um, 
they called them the basement kids, but I, I don't know, you know, the kids that were told that they weren't smart because they were black. So I would volunteer my time in the basement. So then people started to think, I guess I was a basement kid because, so they made me stop. And that hurt me and it, and it left a mark on me because for me, it became important to be, to rally for people who didn't have mothers like mine. My mom, when they tried to tell me in the first grade I couldn't read, they were gonna put me as a basement kid. She came up there with a bat, like uh, the, oh, huh. <laughs> well, the bitch could read when I brought her here. If she can't read now, it's because you did something wrong. So they brought in experts. They brought in a black teacher named Mrs. Brown. And um, I think she was one of, no, well, somebody was Mrs. Brown, but the black teacher, she really made an impact. She was fly. She was beautiful, you know, for the, like 70s, honey. She had her, you know, her skirt, you know, was kind of A-line and she would have her, you know, her bow ties and she would come in and teach me and make sure that I was able to, you know, keep up with my class. So... It was important for me to always give back. And when that opportunity was taken away from me, you know, because they considered me, I was in this group called the Singing Angels. If you're from Cleveland, you know, that's fancy. You know, I was traveling the world, you know, preparing for what I'm doing now. And they tried to, you know, protect me. And it only made me want to tell the truth about my people even more. You know, I would see, I only wanted to date dudes from the hood, you know, because the, mm. the guys from where I was from were, were corny to me. Mm. You know, they couldn't dance. You know, I, we tried to do the rock and it just wasn't working. They were the pebble and, you know, and I remember one birthday party, the little boy from the hood beat up the little boy from the, the <laughs> fancy pants and... <laughs> Then he got a spanking for beating up that little boy. And it was just too much for me to handle, honey. It's, it's my birthday. <laughs> I ain't trying to cry. So, you know, I, I, I felt a need to have to defend my people from the stereotypes that were being put upon them by other people. Because when I went in and volunteered my time, I saw these kids were just bad. <laughs> That's all. You just, nigga, sit your ass down. Where your mama ass? She ain't spank you. You know you doing this just like we're doing this. They just don't know how to communicate with you. You whoop the teacher's ass. Where do you think they gonna put you? You literally whoop the teacher's ass. She was pregnant, boo-boo. Where do you think you're gonna get put? So, um... I would date, you know, slick dudes, you know, from the hood, and I would, you know, kick it with girls that were, you know, streetwise. You know, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't interested in where the box that they were trying to put me in. So it became important to me to speak their, their truth. Well, did you grow up with both parents or just your mom? Just my mom. Okay, so yes. where's your dad? So my dad died. Oh. When I was three. Damn. Yes. Yeah, so it was, you know, I, he died. Well, the last words he spoke before going into a coma were in my lap. So, you know, he made me promise to take care of my mom. And that's been something that I've been really working hard to do. It's been, <laughs> you know, moms and their daughters, okay. you know, but it's something that I will always do. My brothers and sisters, sister, my brother and sister, they use it again. Well, you know, I would send money, but you know, your daddy said for you to take <laughs> care of mom. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I got you. Um, so, yes, um, being without a father figure and then my mom remarried and well okay she didn't back in the 70s early 80s they and still now they've got this thing called common law so we basically she I, I don't I never saw a certificate so that's how we ended up in Shaker Heights Ohio um the man that my mother remarried was very wealthy he was a real estate broker so for the 70s that was pretty big and we had a big, pretty house in Shaker. And then he went to jail for... <laughs> 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 
double selling people's houses, honey. He was going to give you the house. He was double house selling houses. And you this house, and you got a house, too. He was like, Oprah giving everybody the same house. So <laughs> they came, they came and tried this, to kidnap okay? me. So, you know, they tried to kidnap me from preschool, and um, it didn't work. So my mom, they called my mom, and they were like, you know, someone is here to take Paula. And, they, you know, they called Paula J. And, you know, should we give her to them? And my mom was like, someone is there. So my mom tried to run and grab me, but before she could get me, they grabbed her and my stepfather and pistol whipped them and tied them up in the closet, stole all her furs, boot a boot, bada boot jewels everything so yeah i've been um wait so who, who blessed was, and not blessed and who and was blessed who was, trying to, who was trying to kidnap you then the people who were mad oh the people know, that your stepfather that, that, was, yes, was robbing they were trying to, i guess the plan was we'll get her and then we'll tell them they give us our money back or we won't give her back to them but thank God the nursery school was like, we're not having it. You're not signed to take her out. Yeah. You know, so instead they went and took it out on my mother and her husband, which is like my mom's life is so much more interesting than mine. It's it's just filled with so much hilariousness. So they survived that. The business went on. And because of that, he ended up getting indicted and going to federal prison. And my mom, being the diva that she is, was like, you know, I'm not going to move my child from the best school system in the Cleveland, greater Cleveland area because of this fuck up. You know, so it started circulating that this guy was my real dad and blah, blah, blah. So my mom went and bought um, a company that she was working for. My mom is a seamstress. So she sold plastic covers. You know those plastic covers on your grandmom's furniture? Mm -hmm. So she sold those. So she bought the business. She went and got an FHA loan. Hello, diva. Yes, back in the 70s, they were giving out those minority women loans. And so she went to um, her Jewish boss who owned it. It was called Rose Plastic Cover Companies and Company. And it was the the number one in the whole Cleveland, you know, Sandusky, the whole area. So she bought a number one company and she started hustling it. And we became nigga rich, like overnight. It was buying mansions and, you know, brand new cars every other year. And it was just, it was a great role. She was uh, has always been a great role model for me well you mentioned that at one point uh as a child you got molested yes i did how old so that was this new guy's son so your stepdad's right son. the guy who was doing all the double dealing okay. his son was 16 and my dad died when i was two um so my mom brought him into my life when i was around um four and um, they were upset because they thought my mom took their father from his their their mom. Mm -hmm. So they thought that they would take that out on me. And you know, it took a lot of therapy for me to understand that his um, molestation was not about me as much as it was about his anger at the divorce of his parents and his inability to do anything about it and to, because he felt so weak, there was a weaker party involved and he used his anger against me. And it was really, really hard because, you know, I always, I'd always prayed for a big brother, you know, to look out for me because, you know, I, I'd lost a little brother um, my mom and dad, before he died, my mom was pregnant and, you know, she lost the baby and it was all, it was sad. So I was, I was excited, you know, but it became like hell on earth. You know, there were guns involved and, you know, a lot of, um, drugs on his part. 
he was addicted. That's one of the reasons why it's hard to raise children in a wealthy community because they have access to drugs and knowledge about drugs that other kids can't afford, you know? So he was doing heroin and it was the 70s. You know, it's just, you know, he was in high school doing it and hanging me off you know, balconies by my ankles and, you know, putting guns to my head and I'm five. So it <sighs> left a, I guess, a definite scar on me in terms of how I viewed men and the power that they held over women mm. and the way to diffuse that power was he ever caught was he ever convicted yeah um i told everyone i i you know i told my grandma when i got old enough to really understand i told my grandmother and my grandmother told my mother and you know my mother left the situation it was hard for us to get out we had to we had to sneak away like slaves in the night you know for her to get out of this situation because he was abusive, her, her ex-husband. I don't like to speak mm -hmm. ill of the dead. Um, he was always a good father to me. His thoughts of what a fatherhood should be were interesting, but, you know, he was, he never, he wasn't the, the culprit. You know, he was someone that I looked, I was able to look to as a better father, a good father figure. You know, he never, he never, you know, but he allowed and I don't know if it was, but when my mom found out finally, she, you know, she, you know, she, she, my mom's always been connected, you know, um, my father, because of my father, my father was connected. He, you know, in Cleveland, um, he was in a group called the Lunch Bunch with a lot of major players, including, um, Donald King that all came from Cleveland. So my mom was able to go to, my godfather, um, Johnny Ferris, if you guys know any of these names. My, um, these are big players, big time players in Cleveland underworld. Okay, and what happened to the son? He, I don't know. I just know that he had a extreme heroin problem and they, you know, they, I don't know. But I have he, no idea. He was I, never, I but in terms of the, the molestation, there was no conviction. No, my mom, there she called no... them folks. She didn't go through the channels that, you know, other people go through. My mom went, she called them folks. Okay, so they got beat up, basically? I don't know. You don't know? I was a child. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I'm sorry I had to go through that. That's like yeah. every but, parent's you know, nightmare with their children. I believe that God does things for a reason. You know, I could have been a slut, but it kept me from, it affected me differently. It made me withdraw from men and mm -hmm. not trust. So I was an anomaly in, in Hollywood. You know, I'm, I, I learned to be more of a tease. Hmm. You know, I learned to, you know, make promises that I, I didn't have to deliver on to hmm. keep people, you know, away. And I genuinely believe that everything happens for a reason. You know, women are given deformities for that same reason. Um, I know some girls say they have, they think they have ugly feet. So it keeps them from getting butt naked in the strip club. You know, because I know if I was a bad bitch, I'd be in a strip club, baby. I'd be like, oh, twirly, twirly, give me that buddy, yeah. But I ain't that bad bitch, you know. I'm a bad bitch, but not that bad bitch. So I think when women are given um, uh, bodies that attract that type of attention, it it they learn quickly how to use it you know, mm -hmm. for their benefit, for their survival. And because that happened to me so early, I learned how to survive, you know, despite yeah. it. Well, you graduate high school and then you go to Howard. Yeah. So you go from this 
all white area. Well, I, I my senior year I transferred to Cleveland Heights High. Okay. Because I went heads up with um, this kid that he was the president of senior council from seventh to eleventh and twelfth grade. I wanted to be the president. I was his. I was his Condoleezza Rice. I was his <laughs> black vice president running mate, and we totally ruled from seventh to eleventh. Twelfth, I said, you know, Jimmy, let me be the you know president, and this time you, it's not going to going to affect your college applications. You're already friggin' you got all these years. They're they're going to see that you did it out of humility. Oh no, when he wasn't having that, so they cheated, and they blatantly cheated, and they bragged about cheating, and I left the school. Um, uh, we didn't want to fight, you know. I I've always been a fan of Halle Berry, who is also from Cleveland, Ohio, hmm. um, and something similar like that happened to her. She had something stolen from her. I think maybe. It was a, a crime. I don't know something, but they fought, and it was in the papers, and you know. But for me, it was a vice presidency, a presidency that I had won, you know. And and they were in the halls like, if you want hip hop at the prom, you know, then you'll vote for this. But who wants it? You know, they really didn't get the hip. They weren't. They weren't feeling hip hop yet. We be we be on the front steps like la di da di. Lottie, you know, and they'd be like, oh, my God, she's got hair on her arms and legs, you know. So there was some definite cultural differences, and um, they weren't having it. So I decided to go to Cleveland Heights High my senior year because it became um, apparent to me that I wasn't being taught how to love myself. Mm. And I knew I wanted to go to Howard University, not just because, mostly because my father's name was Howard. And for some reason in my mind, it would be, you know, what he would have wanted. And um, also because of Debbie Allen and Felicia Rashad. Mm. They both went there. And they both went there. And I, um, I wanted to learn more about my culture. So I decided to go to Cleveland High Tide, which is more of a melting pot. You know, it's um, got all cultures, and I, I really, I, I was, I got popular quickly. People loved me. I realized I loved black people. You know, in high school, I'd go to clubs. My, you know, my girls. I was in a gang <laughs> called Cliche, and you know, this was in junior high school. It was so hilarious because like Midwestern gangs, and that's why I was watching Mike Epps in his special recently, and he was talking about his gang called the mad dogs i think we had the q dogs or the mad dogs or something but our gangs in the midwest i was like he must be from the midwest because our gangs we stepped you know we danced so you know i was in this group called cliche so we were pretty popular in in cleveland so you know me going to a different school was um kind of traumatic but it was something that needed to be done because you know, I was very, I was, I was pretty popular already. So um, yeah, I, I don't know. I had a point to telling you guys about cliche. There really was a point, but I kind of, I kind of got nostalgic well, for a second there. Well, you go to Howard, right? And you graduate, right? Bachelor of a bachelor's of arts degree, yes. And then you move to New York City, yes. And then at that point, uh, you start performing at clubs. Well, see, they're, they don't know what they're talking about. I okay. went to Howard and, you know, I mean, gosh, you know, I'm writing a book. But I went to Howard and I was able to be taught by some of the best act, black actors in Hollywood. Um, uh, Ruby Dee and Ozzie Davis, Denzel, mm. you know, he came back. Um, mm. Debbie and Felicia would come back. Um, but... Don Lewis came back and it like blew me away. And you know, I was I was that young chick that was like, mm-hmm, well you gonna see me, you know. And I basically heckled her, like her whole like speech, because I was just I 
I just want her to see me. And, you know, I have felt so bad about that ever since. And, and so since then, she's been like, I don't even remember that. Boo-boo. I was giving you love and you received it. And I did. At the end of the day, it was it seeing her specifically because I had been taught, you know, that I, in Cleveland, I thought I was light-skinned, you know. And, you know, I thought I was Halle Berry's, you know, because we don't have too many Halle Berry's, you know, in Cleveland. We got a few, you know, but if you're, you know, if you're my complexion, you're considered light skinned, especially winter comes, you go inside. But when I got to Howard and I saw the multitude of beautiful black complexions from your complexion that is genuinely black with red hair and freckles down to, you know, midnight blue with just gorgeous tones and everybody fiercely dressed, honey, like everybody had money. I was like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I felt like I, would, I had just stepped onto you know, Zamumba. You know, it's, it's <laughs> I was like, everybody Gucci boots, baby. Yes. And it was just, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I needed that to be able to, to move forward um, in my career. I went to Howard because I wanted the opportunity to, to get on main stage. Um, I worked with a good friend of mine on a project and she told a story of how when she went to NYU, they excluded them from main stage productions to the point where I think they put on The Wiz and they cast it all white. So <laughs> she said, or the color purple or something idiotic like that. So she said that she um, she and her classmates picketed. And a lot of the people who were part of that um, whole debacle were still working in Hollywood. And she was telling me how it bothered her. And I said, well, you have no one to blame but yourself. Because at Howard... I was on main stage since freshman year and that's and I was the only one who had ever been given that privilege and that's what gave me the confidence to know that I had a place in Hollywood you know beyond you know somebody's you know mammy or whatever yeah <laughs> have you so you get to New York right and, okay, so my yeah. friends in New York, so I was able to meet, you know, so many people who weren't like people then. They were just my friends, like Puffy and... Um, oh, right, because Puffy went to Howard also, yeah. Right, and he was there when I was there, and all of his friends would come there, Heavy, Heavy D, mm. um, everybody. Um, Lord Jamar, you know, I was my there. Yep. Um Everybody, I, you know, I I don't want to kind of, you know, just the name, blah, 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 the name, blah, blah. but yeah, I was a part of that whole movement. You know, my best friend, she was responsible for you, you know, f for you ever even seeing groups like Tribe and, you know, her sister, Chrissy Murray, you know, is a legend in the game, you know, so I was able to be loved by people that, you know, brought me, made me popular. Like, people don't understand that. Like, Joan Crawford, she was a dance hall girl. Her name became famous throughout California because she wouldn't wear no drawers and she would do the Charleston, you know? So that's how she got, you know, into. So I have my drawers on, don't, I'm not, I'm just using the analogy to say, <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, I was, I was a kid. Um, and sometimes you don't want to wear none because, you know, but ladies, you know what I'm saying? When I had pen last show, I was much thinner then. But anyway, we're, we're going to stay on, going to stay focused. <laughs> so, you know, um, what was the point I was making? Yeah. So my friends from New York, you know, they would, they would love me, you know, and they would protect me. So I, I was popular as a person be always before I became an actress. And that's the point I'm trying to make with um with using Joan Joan Crawford as an example because she was popular 
as a socialite, a person before, you know, and, and that is how we get jobs in Hollywood. You know, there's a new wave, but it doesn't cease. You know, you when you're first starting out, you have to get a publicist because you can't just go to any party. There's the right parties that you need to be at and you need to be seen with the right people. And I went to Howard, so we created our own right people. You know, mm -hmm. I went to college with Arnell Simpson and she became one of my best friends and we we tore this we tore this town up if there had been a reality show about you know the hearts we were breaking it would you know i'm just saying you know the kardashians like i remember when they were arnell's baby sisters you know when we'd go and they looked up to her i you know i remember kedada that's always been my girl all the little Hollywood socialites, you know, Arnell was, you know, the queen. But, you know, it 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 it's sad that what happened happened. You know, and I, I was here during all of that and a part of all of that and it it really broke my heart to to tell the truth. And I don't think any of us have, you know, fully recovered from you know, that whole situation. So you get to New York right. and you start working. And well, I, I'm not working as a stand-up comedian. I'm just silly. I'm funny. Yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a clown. I like to have fun. So mm -hmm. I get a job at Jezebel. But I get that job through Phyllis Siobhan Stickney. So I, I, I get... I get to, so I'm in Howard. I'm at Howard. And I do my final graduation scene with Anthony... Carl Cockroach Payne, Cockroach, remember Cockroach from the, uh, my boy Bill Cosby, Cosby show, yeah. show, Cockroach. Yeah. So he went to college with me and he was like, he was our star and Anthony Anderson was like our baby, you know, cause Anthony came like when he was 16 and the rest of us were like 17, 18 and he got a scholarship and like skipped a grade. So those were our, you know. Ugh, we're gonna we're gonna lift him up. So I did a scene with Anthony Payne from Extremities where he raped me, and I got I won uh, an internship with Woody King, and the New Federal Theater Company, and he recommended me at the same time for another internship with Douglas Turner Ward in the NEC, the Negro Ensemble Company. So that's how I got to New York. Mm -hmm. But because I had so many people there, this was my, that was my place. And I, I had family there. My mom made me live with my auntie, but she was old. And, you know, I come home and she was going through the change and her dress be all up over her and just everything exposed. And I was a baby. I just didn't want to see all that. So <laughs> I convinced my mom. Finally, it was drama anyway. Um, I convinced my mom to get me a, a room, which was like a box with a toilet and in 23rd and Lex, and I moved there. And, you know, when I say my, my college friends took care of me, I mean, literally, like, um, so right after graduation, when I moved to New York, my best friend was dating um, Sweetwater. Yeah, Sweetwater. And he was Eddie Murphy's best friend. Hmm. Um, so I got a master's class from Eddie Murphy right after college. Hmm. And I don't know if he remembers that it was me or even knows, but he taught. He taught me. He sat there and he showed me Mom's Mabley. And he paused and he showed me and explained what made it funny, what made the scene funny. Um, he introduced me to, um, Rudy Ray Moore. He put in some Rudy Ray Moore. He's actually doing a Rudy Ray Moore movie. Yes, I on, heard. On Netflix, yeah. I heard. <laughs> I know, my baby Lou told me. Yeah, um, Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, my, my big sister. Yeah, interview her all the time. She, um, she's in it also. She's why I'm here, like, just so you know. I hmm. was like, okay, if my if big sis says go out, I'll, I'll do it. I love okay. this boy. So, um... Yeah, so I got 
I got a master's class, you know, from Eddie Murphy before even, you know, auditioning for anything. Yeah. And just the fact that he took the time. And I don't I honestly I don't I don't even know if he knows it was me. Like I don't even know if we've never talked about it. I've never, you know, really seen him to be like, "Hey, Eddie, remember that time that young girl that you like?" I mean, he spent hours. Like it was straight up a master's class from the friggin' master. And um <clears throat> it changed my life. Yeah, I mean, Eddie is the greatest stand-up comedian turned actor of all time, honestly. You know, there's been lots of comedians who, who've done acting, but I don't think any of them really have gotten to an Eddie Murphy level. No, or talent. And the passion he had for teaching. Like, mm. I don't think people understand. Like, um, he went in depth. Like, it was, <clears throat> it's something... <clears throat> I believe he should do, you know, for others. Yeah. So I so then after that, I'm still working for Phyllis, and Phyllis is an actress, and she's like, "Look, boo boo, I can't pay you, so I'm sending you over to Alberta Wright. Albert Wright is um, the Michael Wright's mom, who owns a restaurant called Jezebel, and it's mm-hmm. it was I, I'm not sure I don't even think it's still there." But at the time, it was like the premier, you know, theater row black restaurant. Anyone who was anyone, you know, frequented Jezebel. Um, and so I got a job there. And the whole theme was a bordello. And you had to be cute to work there. You had to wear heels. You had to learn how to balance the tray. And I, I saw Forrest Whitaker hmm. come in. And one of the major no-nos was you're not allowed to speak to patrons in in a way where you're selling yourself. And so I went and got my picture and my resume, <laughs> and I sold myself, <laughs> and I got an audition. The very next day, he called me in, and I had to go to work. And he said, do you want this job, or do you want to go back to work? And I... I couldn't just leave Alberta hanging dry and I felt like I just couldn't, it wasn't a sure enough thing for me. And I guess I was scared, you know, maybe if I had have said, but neither here nor there, I went back to work and I lost my job. I lost my job and I had to make something happen. So I was making at Jezebel, um, I was making stripper money. I mean... (laughs) No, straight up. I was bringing home like 500 a night. A good night was a G because the clientele was so rich. They were tipping like $100 a a bill. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was bringing home some real banks. So it helped me. And I guarantee you, my mother was like, you know, you don't have a job. You've got a month and you come back to Cleveland. And I was like, I booked, <laughs> I went and got the backstage magazine, honey. And I booked Apollo Comedy Hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and I booked over like 600 other women in the tri-state area. And it was myself and Lisa Nicole Carson. And that was my first break. So you're getting TV gigs. Right. But then you get your first movie role. Right. Which was? Well, that's hard. So Robert Townsend relocates me, and I'm in L.A. And I meet uh, Ice Cube and Yo-Yo because I'm on Townsend Television. And they come on, and they do Bonnie and Clyde thing. So, you know, I'm not thinking... You know, this is going to lead to my first major film. I'm just, you know, being me and being cool and falling in love with the two of them. You know, heroes. Um, I'm a hip hop head. So then I that show gets canceled and I get put on hold by Fox. So I can't do any more TV. So we're like, you know, actively searching for movie roles. And Rusty Condiv calls. 
And he's doing this project called Tales from the Hood. And I go in and I read for that. The same exact week, I go in and I read for Friday. So I booked them both. Hmm. So it's hard to say that Friday is my first because so is Tales from the Hood. I was shooting them simultaneously. Like, to the point, my girl, Zandra Pollard, I'm giving you a shout out, who did my nails and my hair for that film. She was reminding me, like, last week how I had to go back and forth. Like, she would have to take my hair out, all those braids, take them out so that I could put the sissy wig on and take the nails off. And I didn't have, back then, you could go and get the glued on joints, you know, from <laughs> CVS. Um, back then, we we she was straight up, you know, doing the doing the thing on thing, and she was reminding me that. So I was literally going back and forth. Like on Monday, I'd have to shoot for Tales from the Hood, and then I'd have to shoot that Friday for Friday, you know. And so I I I did them both simultaneously, and it just you know in my head, I thought to myself, okay. This script is a lot more, you know, it has a lot more to say, um, Tells from the Hood. I think this one is probably going to hit. And, you know, it wasn't. Okay. It wasn't at all, was it? Well, I interviewed uh, DeAndre Bonds. Okay. Who was also in Tales from the yeah. Hood. Yeah. And, you know, right. we talked about how... And he was in Get on the Bus with me. Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, I mean, Tales from the Hood, wasn't Spike Lee, like, the executive producer of that? Yes. Right. Because, so. see, Rusty is one of Spike's. He belongs, he's one of Spike's um, protégés. He belongs mm-hmm. to Spike. You know, I don't know if you guys um, remember Rusty. He was one of the G5G brothers in um, School Days. School Days, yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So, Rusty, you know, he's been down with Spike since, since then, which is why, you know, Tisha, you know, is in Sprung with me. Aha. Uh-huh. So... Okay. That it's all it's all in, incestuous. Yeah. Tales from the Hood was a cool movie. I, yes, I saw it, Tales I saw from the it Hood the too as well. Oh, there was a two. Okay. Yes. I missed that um, one. Netflix ah. just produced a two. You know, I think Tales from the Hood was kind of an important film because now when you see movies like Get Out and Us, yes, really Tales from the Hood was sort of yes, the precursor it set it off, didn't it? of all that. Yeah. And um, I just recently did, uh, I guess, a documentary um, series for Shudder about um called i think film noir or yes um blacks in scary movies Mm. you know throughout the history of film right and um rusty was definitely cited as being you know a forerunner so then there's friday Mm -hmm. then there's friday then there's friday and i've interviewed a bunch of the cast from friday uh Aside from Ice Cube and Chris Tucker. Um, so you book this independent film by, you know, Ice Cube, who had basically just done Boys in the Hood. You know, it was really Ice Cube, the rapper, is what he's really known for. You know, the, the movie thing is starting. You know, he hasn't... Was Ice Cube the producer of Boys in the Hood? I mean, sorry, oh, producer no. of uh, Friday? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and um, I think he co-wrote it with yeah, DJ Pooh. With DJ Pooh, exactly. So now it's really a new thing mm-hmm. for Ice Cube. And then F. Gary Gray, who was a video mm-hmm. operator for, um, you know, a hip hop show. Mm-hmm. B. E. T. Uh, well, it was a D. Barnes show. Was it? Though? Yeah, he was. He was actually the, the cameraman for for D. Barnes. So you have all these kind of new people putting this film project together, shoestring budget. Did you have any idea what it was going to be when you first started working on it? Um, I just knew I wanted to be a part of it. Um, I, I had heard about it through the grapevine, and I wanted to be a part of it, and I made it happen. You know, and we, being on that set was like one of my first experiences. So it was like I had this experience where I was on set with people my age 
and blunts was being passed and jokes <laughs> was being cracked and music was blaring and love and you know the dozens and then i had this other set that i'm on where i'm learning and there's there's no jokes and it's very quiet and you know it there's we're on a sound stage which was something i'd never experienced you know and when i was doing sketch comedy we just worked at you know a sound stage but i didn't know that the the house that i see outside the exterior is not where we're going to shoot <laughs> You know the interior. Mm -hmm. The interior is usually a sound stage, and it's it's something totally unlike. Uh, you know, there's all these cutaway walls. So this tells from the hood introduced me to the um, the magic of Hollywood. And Friday, I didn't know it was something new that people just did go on that. You know, yeah, you'd be on set like yo, yeah. I didn't know because I'd never really experienced what it was like to be on set before beyond you know and so i had that balance well how did you get the actual role well i auditioned for it and you know it was it was a blessing that i had met um cube prior to the audition because um f gray gray he gave me the part he's my friend and, but he wasn't the final say, you know? So he was like, okay, now you gotta come in there. You gotta try to look like the part. And you know, this is gonna be the table read. And even though I've given you the part, if he doesn't like you, then, you know. So I didn't know if Cube was gonna remember me or not from, you know, times and television, mm -hmm. but he did. And he liked the shorts that I had on. <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> he was like, damn. You ain't got no ass, but you wearing them shorts. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, thank you. You want to get the part? And yeah, I get the part. <laughs> Wear them shorts on, on the, for the movie. And he told, he told, uh, told him to, so yeah, to okay. put the shorts on me. So you played Joy yes. in the movie. Right. So I remember, I mean, this is you know, one of my favorite all-time movies. And the first time I watched the movie, you know, you don't catch all the little details, <laughs> all the little Easter eggs and whatever else in the movie that, that you start to get later on. Okay. So your first scene when you call up Craig and you're cussing so, him out, accusing him of, of being with some other guy. Is this the guy in the bed with me? I did not notice that guy in the bed until like my fifth time and the seeing the movie. Like I when I recently... F. Gary Gray just got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, so mm. I went to support that. And um, and it was funny because Cube was like, yo, you know, out of all the stuff I've done, the biggest question people have is the dude in the bed with joy when I call. And we bust out laughing. But, you know, we never, you know, acknowledge that, you know, from my from my my perspective being there that was gary and i remember he shot it like um quickly because he didn't want anybody to come and you know fuck with it so he put his boy in it he was like come on we gotta get this done let's get this done so i can i can show them i need to show them what i mean they're not gonna understand it so I was like, your boy, what you, what you mean? What you, uh, no, 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 he that he's not going to be with me. So I was like, okay, well, give me some boxer shorts. So I put the boxer shorts. That's why I have the boxer shorts on it. And it's it's genius. And um, I, I, so I gave those props to Gary on Instagram recently. And people thought that I was saying that it was Gary who was in that who was that guy? But it wasn't. Yeah, no, it was it's his not Gary. Boy. Right. It was you, his idea. It was his inspiration. It was a. It was a Gism. Right, because you're it sitting here. Oh, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> you're sitting here accusing your boyfriend of cheating on you. Right. When you're actually have another guy in the bed right. the whole time. She's a pill. Who, who doesn't even care? 
asleep. <laughs> He's just asleep. Like, yeah. not, <laughs> not even giving a shit. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, those were the days when women were able to be, you know, like just recently, I think um, Cardi B just got dragged because she said she was robbing niggas. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, okay, well, that's new to you guys. <laughs> I mean. You've done some of that? I No, but I'm sure Mary Magdalene has. <laughs> you know what the hell? You know, it's not, it's not new. Yeah. It, you know, excuse me, what she was doing is not new. Um, I'm sure there, it, it had to have been real and it had to have struck home with so many people because so many people felt it and related to it. So, you know, I, I'm i just saying it to me was liberating, especially for those times, because it let dudes know what you can do, I can do better, you know? And I think that's why so many women identified with Joy. You know, it's beyond the fact that she was deemed a hoochie mama, but she was independent. She had her own car. She had money. Right. You know, she was willing to give as long as you know she was being treated right. Right, and Two Live Crews, Hoochie Mama was your theme song. Yes, <laughs> and I was honored because you know Luke wrote that for me, and then you know he became my friend, and he put me in the video, and it was just it was just a, a it was I was a huge fan of Luke, you know, because of what he's brought to America, just the freedom of speech and oh, yeah. his fight and his strength and, yeah. you know, so that he even, you know, I, I was just, you know, I'm, I'm from Cleveland, so I'm a fan, you know, I'm a fan first. And so mm. when I got here and I started getting fans, you know, it was just, it was kind of surreal. You know, when you're a fan and they're a fan, it's like, wow, you're a fan. I, no, I, I feel I'm you. a fan. Okay. I feel so you. So it, it's, it's you know, it's a blessing and it's kind of surreal. What were some of the standout lines when you were cussing out Craig? You ain't got to lie. You know, <laughs> and oh my gosh, when Beyonce said that line, you know, a lot of things that are on paper, you know, actresses make their own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of my movies, I add stuff. So, you know, a lot of that is me, you know, um, within the context of what Cube and DJ Pooh wrote, you know, and I, I do that with all my films, you know. Uh, my boy from um, Craig Brewer, you know, he was like, you know, when I was, when we were shooting um, the film, what's the name of that dang old film? Hustle and Flow. Um, you know, I was so frustrated. But then you made me look like a genius. So I I have an understanding of people, you know, because I probably could have been a psychologist. And I I read beyond what's on the page. And I attempt to give meaning to the urban woman's journey and struggle that people don't understand. You know, it's okay for this dude to be in here, you know, you know, thinking he gonna get some for nothing. For what, $5, $20, that's what you think my pussy's worth? No, nigga. You know, it's worth your life. <laughs> Not for real. It gave you life. Well... So I'm just saying that to say, I I believe that the characters that I play were misinterpreted as being negative for the community. I'm I my attempt was to show what is real and what is going on and what is being ignored. You know, our young girls are in these strip clubs mm -hmm. and they are being pimped. Yeah. by people looking to make a record, not someone looking to take care of your daughter or your child or, you know, provide a future. These are the types of jobs that you get in and get out. You know, Hustle yeah. and Flow was Craig Brewer's biography, you know, and people don't know that. They think that this was the story of some black guy in Memphis. No, it was the story of 
straight up white guy in Memphis who was pimping chicks so that he could get out the game and write about it and tell his tale and it led to a career that's non stoppable. So you know, there was a scene with you on the phone. Mm-hmm. Then you show up to Craig's house mm-hmm. and Neil Long is coming out. You know, you guys have that little exchange. And then Craig works it out with you and you're in your car and he asked for the money mm-hmm. and he was you're about you're about to give it to him. And then Felicia shows up. <laughs> and I actually, I actually interviewed uh, Angela Means. It's normal for her to to borrow small appliances. Like, why is everyone tripping? Like, right. like I've never asked to use your blender. <laughs> All of a sudden, I asked to use your microwave. You tripping? <laughs> you tripping? That's a baby. You know. Everyone, I don't know what your question is. You just got to give me a rundown <laughs> of what happened in the movie. I remember movie I was there and I'm just playing, but really. Um, I don't know the question, but I'm just going to say, you know, that experience for me was legendary because I met Nia through Arnell. And this is just how life works. You know, I knew Arnell from college. When I got to L.A., she took me under her wing and introduced me to Nia. Nia took me under her wing. So when I got on set, I had a vet. You know, Nia Long has been in this game since she was like eight. She was on Archie Bunker's place. I was at home. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. A fan of Nia Long. You know, she was a pretty little girl then, you know what I'm saying? I, mm-hmm. And a tootie, you know, I was, I've always been a fan because, you know, this. I wanted to be, I was in Cleveland, I was a singing angel because I wanted to be Shirley Temple. Like I, I I couldn't tap a lick, you know, barely. I could <laughs> sing white people's songs. My brother put me in the singing angels, not the singing angels. There's a difference. So, you know, I can sing. You know, I, I can hold, you know, but I can't sing. You know, so, but I will try. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it was, um, yeah. So what, what did you ask me about? Well, well I mean, just, just the writing of it was so was so genius in yes. terms of the, the, the script. Realness. The script. I think it was. Oh, so so Nia had my back. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I came on set with a veteran actress who had already worked with Cube. You know, who had all of these guys wrapped around her finger. So when I had issues with lines that I wanted to add or change. Nia would have my back because they'd be like, they try me. Because if you go and you go, you get got, got, you know. But I find that women that are from Los Angeles not only get more respect, but they understand the game more. The fact that it's just a game, that it is about friendships, it's not about talent talent is nice you know but um loyalty friendships respect um that's a lot more important and women from los angeles they get that whereas the imports they come in and they make it about the fame and the money and the backstabbing and that's what turns the game around you know but i was blessed enough to work on my first project with la natives you know, so I got a firsthand look at what the game is supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like love. It's supposed to look like this is just a job, a book, pass the blood, take a sip, <laughs> let's have some fun. We're young and we got a million dollars to make a movie. Yeah. And those relationships that I experienced during the making of that film, there's not one person in that film that we don't love and still respect each other. Yeah, the casting on it was brilliant. Well, number one, did you have any idea what Chris Tucker was about to become after doing that movie? Because that was his first acting job, period. Well, no. I knew Chris from Townsend Television. Oh, he was on that? Right. No. Ah, No. No, because Robert didn't see him. I saw Chris, and... I used to to be like, and, and I don't know if Chris ever got on there or not, but he used to come around 
And I used to be like, oh, you're so cute. I don't get why. And you're, and he used to make me laugh. You know, but he was like, I don't know what you call him. Like, we used to have him at Howard. You know, it was a bunch of folk that was at Howard that didn't go to Howard. That's how Chris <laughs> was. He was there, but I don't know why he was there because he wasn't performing. <laughs> but he was funny. And I used to be like, Robert. And I would bring Robert over to him. And I'd be like, Robert, you got to see this guy. And, you know, I think that, you know, bled over into when Chris finally got his opportunity. You know, I was an actress. And, you know, he, he, you know, people would ask me to help because I, at that time, was, there weren't that many trained actresses working on urban independent films. You know, it, there were a lot of rappers, you know, and he was a comedian, stand up. So he listened. So, yes, I knew. I knew Chris was, was special. I tried to tell Robert. And, you know, when I when I saw him there, Chris and I were cool. That was my boy. He'd be like, so. And he, you know, that's what strikes me as someone is going to make it humility. Because anyone can say to you, and Tupac had that same humility. Anyone can say to you, you know, ask you a question. But to genuinely listen to the answer and to grow from it that that's special well i interviewed john witherspoon Spoon. and uh he said everyone made five thousand dollars on that movie five grand everybody else on the show they're gonna say they made more money anybody made no money on that movie okay five thousand did chris tucker do do about the same you think about the same thing about the same yeah aj johnson said he didn't get anything i didn't get no five dollars you got less than five yeah uh, yeah what'd you get they paid me gas money to get up and then back home. You did it for free? Uh, basically. Did you get a paycheck for that movie? Yeah, I was signed with William Morris. Oh, okay. So you made sure you got your money. I didn't make sure. They made they, sure. They made sure you got your it, money. You know, I was signed with William Morris and uh, Three Arts Entertainment. And I was signed with the same people that F. Gary Gray was signed with. Okay. So, you know, I'm finding out. In Hollywood, um, because I don't have literary representation, that you will get ganked if you don't have someone fighting for you. Such a 90s term, ganked. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard that one in a while. It's real. <laughs> I remember that word. Okay. So, the movie comes out. And, well, before it even comes out, I remember John Witherspoon kind of told me how... Uh, you know, they basically had gotten the funding themselves. Ice Cube and, you know, his crew had gotten the funding themselves to do the whole movie. But New Line Cinema convinced them at the end for them to, like, take an ownership stake in it. And, you know, them, you know they were going to take all the risk in case the movie did bad. Ice Cube was going to put up the money himself. Right. But New Line Cinema talked him out of they it. They said, look, ain't no sense you losing $2 million. All that. The movie bomb, we just take the hit. The movie grow $300 million. He could have gotten all that. And they're not going to come back and say, we made a, look, we made a lot of money. We're going to give you all the bonus. That ain't some bullshit. That don't happen in Hollywood. How did it feel to be such a key character in that movie? Which is, you know, when you look at, you know, for lack of a better word, like hood, hood films, this is really at the top of the pile. You know what I mean? Like, especially, I mean, hood comedies, most people put this as the number one. I think... Living in Los Angeles has been one of the most humbling experiences in my life because I'm in a bubble. I've always lived in a bubble. I went from living in the suburbs to going to Howard. It's a bubble. It's in the hood, but it's in a bubble, its own little campus bubble, to coming to Hollywood, which, like I said, I came here, I relocated with a job, which puts me in a bubble. So I was always under the studio system. Now the studio system is different than it was when the old school studio system started. But by being by coming out here with a job, brought out here by Fox, I was always taken care of. I was always protected. I was always looked after. So I've never really, you know, I've 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 never really seen what the real Hollywood is. You know, and I started seeing it. You know, I it it's 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 not. What was your question? 
what what was it like to have that film just blow up it oh it's it's hard because okay so my point was living in a bubble i never really knew i was famous you know because i never went anywhere no one ever said to me oh you're the girl i didn't know so (laughs) it kept me humble and especially because everybody's famous in california you know they're not gonna let you know you're famous because they're famous so i never knew i was famous and i would until i started to see people walking around looking just like the character that i was playing and i and i was at a club one night and i was waiting in line and these girls about three of them came up and they were dressed just like joy I mean, like long, the braids, long braids, the nails, everything. <laughs> and I said to the bouncer, you're not going to let me in? Ask them who I am. They're dressed like me. <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> and I didn't get in. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell is this? So I think people saved my life. So many people. You know, whatever was going on in that part of that bouncer did not want me in. So I was like, I'm going home. And, and I used to have an all the time. Like, there'd be these parties, and they'd be just off the chain. And somebody would steal my tickets to go to the party. So I didn't get to go. You know, and I'd be like, oh, God. You know, Friday went on to become a franchise. There okay. was, I mean, Friday, next Friday, and Friday after next. Why didn't you show up on any of the subsequent Friday movies? Well, for movies? me, personally... When I was doing Friday, Cube came up to me and he talked to me. He was like, I really like you. I really like your work. And I, I'm writing a script, you know, and it's called Players Club. And I wrote a part for you. And I want you to play um, the little sister and her little cousin. And she ain't got no ass. So you're perfect. And, and you're going to rock it. You're going to be able to show them what you got. And I was like... Okay, I just played, you know, supporting for all intents and purposes for Nini, for Nia, which is cool. You know, now you want me to play supporting for another role that is even worse because this woman is a stripper who gets raped and, you know, and my girl Monica Calhoun tow it up. And the movie is... Uh, is iconic, you know, due to Lisa Ray, um, who prior to the movie, we, we, we vibed. That was my girl. It had nothing to do with her. It was just, for me, the role was another direction in me staying in the supporting lane. <laughs> and I wanted to get out of the supporting lane. So there were a lot of roles that I didn't do. And I think he might have taken that personally. I don't know. Um, I think everything is as it should be. I think that Monica rocked that part. I think the movie is phenomenal. I think he was phenomenal, Jamie. You know, and I I have no regrets. I I just wish he had been able to understand that just because I didn't want that part, you know, it doesn't mean I don't love you. Yeah, I mean, A.J. Johnson, who I interviewed, uh, he was in Players Club as well right. after doing Friday. And he told a whole story about how he was, he had already made an agreement to be in next Friday, and he didn't find out he wasn't in next Friday until he showed up to the set and they t- told him that he couldn't even get on the set. How come you weren't asked to be in the other Friday movies? I was asked. But you were? They, yeah, it was uh, the, the second one. Next Friday. Uh, yeah, the next Friday. Q called me, and uh, we had a meet, and we was talking about the money. And we came, we came to a number that I was getting, and we shook hands, and we was going to do it. And uh, it's like about two, two, three weeks later. I get a phone call and I said, uh, that I mean, I was in the mood. I was gonna shoot it. 
And I get a phone call. He said, he's like, man, they, uh, you know they shooting uh, next Friday. I'm like, uh, they, how are they shooting? I'm, I'm in it. How are they shooting? He's like, yeah, they down on uh, like 105th Street right now shooting. So I get in my car and I go down there. I try to go on the set to talk to Cube, but he done already had me barred off the set where I can't get on. Oh, I'm so like, he knew that was coming. Yeah. I he done had me barred off. I can't I can't get on to talk to him. Come to find out that he done hired the dude from Onyx to play my part. Federal Star. For way less than what he was gonna give me. AJ is my boy. I don't I don't feel Ice Cube did me dirty. I think I might have hurt his feelings because he wrote something specifically for me and I wanted I wanted Lisa Ray's part. You know, it wasn't Lisa Ray at the time, you know, it was a part, you know, that I wanted to bring my chops to. I fell in love with the journey of that character and he kept saying, your ass ain't big enough. <laughs> I was like, damn it, nigga. What the fuck do an ass got to do with the journey that this bitch got to give? And yeah, this, this is before was, ass shots, by the way. Yeah. Leave it around. And so. so when I saw the movie, I got it. Okay, she wants a big ass. Like, I have a big titty. Shit, I'm getting fucking titties. Go to white clubs. Shit. The fuck? Go to the players club. <laughs> The Players Gentlemen's Club. Fuck. <laughs> the fuck. No, I'm just playing. I got it. You know, because mm -hmm. Lisa Ray is my mother. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I got it. You know, but it wasn't her at the time. And I didn't, it wasn't about that. For me, it was about growing as an actor, as an actress. And I didn't. I didn't, I didn't want the part. So I can't, I can't speak on what AJ did. AJ is my honey bunches of oats. But if it was me and I didn't get paid in Friday one, ain't no way I'm turning up for Friday two. That's just me. That's all I got to say about that. There we have it. Okay. So, but you just kept working after that. Uh, I mean, you got on. Uh, I kept hustling. You got on the Wayne's Brothers I show. I being blessed. Thank you, Jesus. You got on the Wayans Brothers show? Well, I got on the Wayans Brothers show because of Jesus once again, back. Um, Marlon went to Howard with me. Mm. So when I was going out, he was coming in. And, you know, he was a baby. So I was the, you know, the grown-up senior. And, you know, he was the baby. So that was my honey. And mm -hmm. so we, he, when he got his own show, he made sure he put me down, you know, and that's why I tell people, that's why I started this off with, you know, people try to act like the parties are unnecessary, the relationships. No, like we were talking about my son going to school, you know, and I was telling you, you know, I'm not putting him in private schools, but I know people that do because this, that's where the fancy pants go. Mm -hmm. You know, you think because you moved to Calabasas, you're going to go, you know, go to school with the Kardashians. No, boo, boo they go to private school, hunty. They not going to Calabasas high. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, you have to put yourself with people that are going to be able to nurture you and vice versa in life. You know, and I'm not saying go and seek out, hmm, there go, there go Puffy. Puffy gonna be a trillionaire one. How the hell was I supposed to know Puffy ass? <laughs> I just liked him. You know what I'm saying? If you're genuine, you, you're just genuine. He was funny. He made me laugh. He could dance. So he was my boy. Mm -hmm. You know, not because he was puffy, he wasn't puffy. I remember puffy used to get beat up. You know what I'm saying? But we love puffy. You know, I'd be like, leave puffy alone. Hey, puffy was getting I'd beat be up. I'd be the first one. Oh, oops. P puffy was getting beat up. Oops. Oops. <laughs> I've done so many interviews where people have painted puffy in a bad oh, light okay. that this is just going to wash in, right, in the sea of other I ones. I thought everybody knew. <laughs> I didn't know people didn't know. Sorry, puffy. And then, you know, a bunch of other movie roles. Uh, 
you know, we talked about Tales from the Hood and Get on the Bus, but there was also uh, Woo, um, Why Do Fools Fall in Love, uh, My Baby's Daddy with Eddie Griffin and Anthony Anderson, uh, She Hate Me with Spike Lee, but I think Sprung was a standout. Oh, that's why my husband said he married me, you know, yeah. thanks to Rusty and that great role. And my chemistry with Joe Torre was just, and my love for Tisha Campbell and Rusty. I think the four of us together, we just made magic. Right. The, the whole the whole part, when, you know, you meet, you meet Joe Torre and, you know, you're all like, you know, and it all begins. With you the know, you're all sexy and everything else like that. And then when you get them arrested, and then you show up to the uh, to the precinct, <laughs> dressed like a like a church girl. Yes, I thought and that guy, was the guy was like, I, I ring a for you. Oh, whatever. <laughs> that's 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 classic. It's a classic. I to me, you know, it hasn't gotten its you know due. I don't know why. You know, I and. This is why I was very um, diligent about the parts that I chose, but clearly I wasn't very good at choosing parts. I turned down Power Rangers, you know, like mm. the, the who turns down the Power Rangers. You know, I thought they were corny, you know, but that's what happens when you're doing this without a team of people that get it. You know what I mean? I didn't get it. Because I turned on the Power Rangers because I thought they were corny. I would have been the first black girl to do uh, whatever those uh, Marvel, whatever that thing is. Super, a superhero people. film, I yeah, guess. Yeah, whatever, for all intents and purposes. Um, so there were opportunities that I turned on because I didn't get the significance of how it would affect the future of my career. You know, mm -hmm. so it kept me in that. So once again, and this is why I didn't take certain roles because I didn't want to be stuck in the supporting roles. But I always remembered that I asked to be consistently working. And that's what was happening in my life. And when I started to get those roles where by the time um, my 30s rolled around, um, people uh, pay attention 10 years in the game and um, you will get that shot and when the shot came at the turn of the century the shots came it was overwhelming i'm um i know people find it hard to believe i'm kind of a shy person and it's 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 um overwhelming for people to follow me around it's overwhelming for people to uh lust after me and and, and be creepy <laughs> but you know my girlfriends oh girl honey i had a stalker last week i don't know what i'm gonna do i had to call the polices and they they had to do the bomb squad and the dog, and now i have oh honey i am just famous i i was like huh <laughs> yeah what <laughs> oh who? Oh, what the hell you know, so I, I realized that I wanted, I wanted to live an extraordinary life on my own terms. So those, those roles scared me, you know. I didn't have anyone to go on these sets with me. I'd be at the mercy of a set full of men. You know, and Me Too just happened yesterday, honey. I, mm -hmm. I've been doing this 25 years, you know, so I, I've experienced it all. So I get married and I find stability. I find my root, myself, and what this this career, what I really want out of it, what, I, what it really means to me. And I want jobs. I want to work. You know, I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable and all that. That's just not what I feel comfortable. But I feel comfortable getting my bills paid. You know, I feel comfortable in a house and not on the streets or in a hotel. I feel comfortable in a car. You know, I, I, I want the money for my craft. Mm -hmm. 
and the seasoning of my craft and the fact that I've been in this industry for 25 years. And now with these new streaming, you know, deals, I'm seeing way less than I saw, you know, back in the day. You know, these streaming deals, the producers, the creators, writers, they keep all the money and, and we don't even see residuals. So mm. just to stay relevant, you're going to have to deal with these streaming outlets. But it only benefits you if you're on the other side of the camera. You do Ray. Mm-hmm. Where Jamie won an Oscar. Oh, yeah, that Ray. Okay, I thought that you Ray Donovan. No. Okay. That Ray, uh, which I think is one of the best uh, music biopics ever. Uh, and you do Hustle and Flow, where you played one of the prostitutes. And, uh, you know, I just rewatched one of the ro one of the scenes where uh, you were just running your mouth, uh, you know, and like telling, you know, telling your pimp that he's your chauffeur and, you know, that he ain't shit and, you know, whatever. And until he finally just snaps and just throws you out of the house. Um, you know, I, I think that was definitely one of your standout performances. And, you know... I, like, you know, people bastardized that character, like even you just said you were just running your mouth. And I don't think people understood that from her perspective, she signed up to get pimped. Yeah. She signed up to be taken care of. She signed up for someone to be there to make sure that she was safe in a job that she didn't want, mm -hmm. but she took to help him yeah. follow a dream that she didn't see but had been patient dealing with for a very long time. Not to mention, she'd allowed other women to come into the fold, you know, without tripping on that either. So when MTV wanted to give me the villain of the year um, thingy thingy, I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to villainize her. And I know you just looked at me like I'm crazy. And well, no, because you know, I never thought of her as a villain. I didn't either, yeah. you know. But if I had, maybe more people, you know. So it's so hard trying to do the right thing because that's a, a missed opportunity that I could have been on an MTV stage honoring a black character, despite what you think of her. But to villainize this woman to me at the time, I thought was quite unfair. I thought to call her a villain simply because she was standing up for what she thought was right was unfair when the villain is the guy who dug in the toilet and killed somebody and ended up in jail at the end. You know, but he's the, the you know, the, the anti-hero and she's, how does she become the villain? You know, and I thought I was only in the movies <laughs> the first half. How, how, how are you going to have a villain in the first half and then, you know, no more villain? I mean, so I thought it was um, villainizing women as well, you know, mm. to say that me jumping ship was the ultimate, you know, uh, betrayal and reason why he didn't get his record deal. Maybe because you dug in the toilet and killed somebody, you didn't get a record deal. That's all I'm saying. You had Isaac Hayes right there. Why you didn't get a record deal then? <laughs> so, you know, and then knowing, you know, I'm just being flipping and silly. But, you know, knowing the history of the, the real characters and the fact that, you know, the original script had, you know, DJ Terrence's character come back to me. You know, hmm. and it, a lot of drama happened and, <clears throat> and myself and Craig created something that I thought was great. And I gave a whole badass monologue, titties out. And I did it as an homage to the Mac. One of my favorite scenes is when he first comes back and He's in the bed with that chocolate girl 
And I, I don't know the, um, her name, and I, and I feel terrible about that. It would be nice if somebody looked it up. Or, but anyway, <clears throat> he, she gives this badass monologue, and she's butt-ass naked. And just to be that free as an actress and to be able to express, and that's what I did. And when John came back and saw it as the executive producer, um, he didn't like it. He didn't like, you know, and it's, I love my mentors, John, Spike, and sometimes they love me too hard because they judge so harshly. You know, it was, you know, I love John. I I really did. John um, Singleton. Yeah. And um, so he, he didn't want me to do a monologue with my titties out. So oddly enough, all the footage got stolen. Um, the truck that was um, hit carried the footage of that day huh. so that's why you you didn't get to see that scene and john didn't want to reshoot it he didn't he didn't he didn't want it to go into that direction because in real life of course craig married his wife and my character was you know well yeah i mean i've interviewed actual pimps right you know from don magic wand to fillmore slim and don magic wand would have never thrown me out like that <laughs> right and, you know, I think, you know, when I when I watch that scene from the perspective of, you know, talking to, to pimps and understanding the relationship between the pimp and the prostitute, you know, like, you know, what I think a lot of people don't realize, because you were like, you know, you know, get angry, you know, hit me, do something, because it seemed like you were seeking an emotional connection and, you know, from talking to the Don Magic Wands, you know, they explained how a pimp and a prostitute is really a relationship, is really like a man and wife. I think a lot of people don't realize is that when it comes to, to the pimp and the hoe, it's not a standard job arrangement. It's actually a relationship. It's definitely a relationship. Yeah. I mean, it's husband and wife. And the bond is even stronger than that because you don't know many wives that will go out and work for their husband and let the husband stay at home and bring the cat. So the bond is so much stronger. It's so much realer. It's so much life into it because of the excitement. And I mean, when you got that platform and the prostitute can stand up next to a man and know her man is number one and she getting the cheer, she feel that. That's the drive that make her want to go out and get a man some money to continue to keep him number one. And I was the bottom. Yeah. You know, and, and, bottom, and that, bitch. that's yeah. even a deeper emotional connection. Yeah. Because I'm the one who brings, you know, the other girls or whatever. Yeah. In. Yeah. So it, it, it was, that is exactly what it was about. It was about this woman wanting him to do what other pimps do when when you talk slick when you jump ship show me that you're still my pimp yeah you know show me that you're still my man because right now i'm feeling like you you want to be a rapper <laughs> and that wasn't the plan so here you are and you're consistently working and you're getting these roles and the, these films are coming out and, and doing well. And then at one point, you stop working and you start having financial issues. Mm -hmm. What led up to that whole situation? Getting married. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, um, Hollywood is a, it's a clique. It's a tight, set family. And um, you don't, you you don't jump ship. It's like being in the mafia. It literally is like being in the mafia. Literally, like being in the mafia, and especially Black Hollywood. You know, it it's not the mafia that you know. It's the mafia you don't know. You know, the, the faces that you don't know. That's Hollywood, and you don't you don't bring in outsiders. This game, like I was trying to say, is. It's a family, it's a clique, it's tight knit, and you don't get out like the mafia, and you don't let outsiders in. And 
the person that cared the most was someone who's very powerful in the industry. And I didn't work, you know, and that that's just, you know, there are stronger women than I who have gone to court, you know, like um, that lady who took Clint Eastwood to court, you know, after their relationship. And she won, you know, but I'm the black girl. And I wasn't taking anyone to court because we don't do that. And we don't tell and we suck it up and we bide our time and we wait for God to vindicate us. Okay. So can you say who that was? Who? The person who essentially is blacklisting you at this point. There are, are numerous. No one in this moment. No one that I know of in this moment. Well, but well, the but damage you, has been done. But, but you, you know? said but you said there was someone very powerful in Hollywood mm-hmm. who, who had a problem yes. with it. Can you yeah. say who that was? No, I don't I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to because I don't think it's important. Okay. I don't think it's important because I don't um I don't want to feed into what I know to be real. You know, it, it's hard being a black woman and the Me Too. If you notice um, from my perspective, I don't know. I'm sure there were some, but uh, I think uh, Lupita was one of the only ones who came out. You know, that's not a coincidence. She's African. You know, there weren't too many black women, you know, because not only have we been taught not to snitch, you know, or kayfabe, as the wrestling world likes to call it, you know, this this industry was built on incestuous practices, you know, and, and keeping it all in the family is what I mean, not literal. You know, we're not going to talk about the mothers and sons and stuff. Like <laughs> okay. I just well, mean, they like to keep it all in the family. So were you in romantic relationships with these men and they had a problem when you got married? Hmm, not all of them, no. Some of them. And um, a lot of them were women who just benefited from their perception of what, how it would help them for me to not work. And from my perspective, because I know this world and I know our God, you know, you're going to get what you're going to get. I'm going to get what I'm going to get. It it doesn't matter. You know, you can't expect to hold one person down and that mean that you're going to win. You're going to win because it's your destiny, you know. And okay. so for me, when this all happened, I was tired. I was really tired of being abused mentally, physically, spiritually on sets i i didn't have a support system i was a single woman and i was going to sets and i was being taken advantage of you know and it wasn't easy so uh brian barber a very good friend of mine sat me down and he was like you know you need a man in your corner you've gotten to a point where you need you got to pick somebody because it's, it's, it's not, you know, and it, we keep our, we keep our secrets to ourselves in Hollywood, you know, you know, people can be talking about it within the mix, but I've got this band around my head, it's good on my nerves, but no one is gonna, you know, we're not going to talk about it outside of the community. Okay. You know, 2019, the Me Too movement is is a right. full swing, mm-hmm. and you know, I have somewhat mixed feelings about it. I think that some of it is is very, very valid. Mm-hmm. Some of it is a money grab mm-hmm. and a shakedown. Mm-hmm. Uh, from your own personal experiences, have you ever had you know like the Harvey Weinstein type situations of well, if you sleep with me, I'll give you this role. And if you don't sleep with me, you're not getting this mm-hmm. role. Just like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Numerous times, my entire career. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about any situations without naming names? Hmm. Think. Hmm. Oh wow. 
it's 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 a lot you know it's it's hard it's like um munch whatever the disease the asperger munchauser i don't know i don't get them all confused when you're when you're kind of brainwashed by your captor you know I don't want to talk about it because it does not hurt anyone but me in my perception to talk about it. Um, The people who did what they did know what they did and they know that it hurt me and they did it for their own advancement, you know, and there are, you know... I don't know. It's it. I say it like this: I love the people who hurt me, despite what they did to me. And to snitch would be to bring down another black man, men, and I'm not for that. I believe in uplifting, not bringing down. And it's my journey to heal from what I allowed to be inflicted upon me. And in the cases of the Harvey Weinsteins, I mean, it's common knowledge that I did a film for Harvey Weinstein and that, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, but... what Was there any inappropriate behavior? There was a lot of inappropriate with, behavior. With Harvey? I'm not, you know, I'll say it like this. I'm a grown-ass woman. If you want me to come somewhere, what the fuck am I coming there for at 4 o'clock in the fucking morning? What the fuck? If, if I want to talk to you about my career, we're going to do it at Miramax Studios, boo-boo. Mm-hmm. Not at... Your hotel room. The, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, it. I never... I never... And like I told you when we first started this interview, I've learned the art of the tease. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, you going to give me before I give you anything. And then if I give you some, it's going to be because you give me again. And I want to. Not because you want me to. And, and that's the power of being a woman. And I don't think that women, they recognize that power. They give their power away. So just because you invite me doesn't mean I'm going to go. I already got the job. So they find other ways to hurt that, where you may begin as the lead of a film. Those who do go, they become the lead in the end. And people that love me, when you know, they did things to them that was helpful to keep me in that demonic mix. You know, because if it wasn't believed that I was down, then I wouldn't be allowed to be there. And that's just the bottom. So a lot of lies that were told on me, um, a lot of fabrications, many, you know, there's a famous black guy who went around and told Joel Schumacher, the godfather of black film, you know, through creating Rolls Royce from Sparkle to you know, car wash, that I was a prostitute. That's the reason I was so good. And in, 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 uh, was that what I did with Colin Farrell? Phone booth. That I was genuinely on street corners, like with that. And, and he said that he recognized me from his cousin's apartment complex. And his cousin came up to me one day and was like, please forgive me. I keep telling this nigga it ain't you. He will not listen. He done told from Joe. He told Hollywood that this person, I don't even know who this person was. I put it in a script. I thought it was so funny. You know, but he and Joel is just so priceless and so, just so, so. And he was like, get get out of my face. Like, flee, be gone with that. You know, thank you, you know, Joel, because... Other things have been said about me, lies have been told about me, and I genuinely think it's the nature of this industry. You can win a part, and overnight, you're a millionaire. And and that type of financial gain is going to create creeps 
and creepy behavior. And people are going to feel like, you know, backstabbing you helps their client or helps their friend or their spouse or whomever. So when you come from Cleveland to a place where you don't really have a back, I don't have, I don't, I didn't have anyone to have my back, you know, so you need a team in this industry to be able to play safely, you know, because there are bitches lesser than me that are dead. You know what I mean? At one point, you became homeless. Mm-hmm. Now, there's different variations of homelessness. I, right. I lost my home. Okay. So. In the 2007 debacle with all those, I was, yeah. I, I was one of the people that was preyed upon. And I was greedy and wanted the money. And I took it. And then my, and then the strike, the writer's strike happened. Mm. So I was on a, a series at the time, which is why I took the money. This was an ABC series? Um, yes, it was ABC Family. Mm-hmm. It was Side Order of Life. So when the strike hit, my writers, they, they joined the strike and quit our show. A lot of writers stayed. You know, a lot of shows continued to work. But my writers, they did not cross the, the picket line. So the writers took care of me for as long as the strike lasted and maybe... A year after when I and I, I love the writers for that, but they didn't take care of me like my show did, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I ended up losing my home, which meant that I needed a job before I could leave the hotel. Because what people don't understand about um, residuals is that actors are at the mercy of the Screen Actors Guild residual department. So there are millions of people who are in need of receiving their residuals. So you have to wait sometimes three to four months when the actual, um, the actual, uh, uh, what is the, the date of when the check was issued, you may receive it three to four months later. And sometimes your bank won't even cash it or honor it because it's, too far back. Uh So then you have to wait again for that next check. And they only cut checks in three increments. So I have to wait. You know, it's not like I can, you know, I have access to my residuals. So so you lost your home. Right. And then you had to go live in a hotel room? Right. Yes. I had to, I didn't have enough for a down payment on, because I did a short sale. Instead uh, of so you had okay, so you sold your house and right. still had a mortgage right. after you sold it. Yes. Because you so, sold it for less than what you bought it for. Exactly. Got it. So I couldn't rent another home with the amount of money that they gave me. Mm. So what I was able to do is set up in a nice hotel until I booked something that would give me a lump sum of money and I could do first, last You know, and in Los Angeles, if I had been in Cleveland or anywhere else, I'd been fine. You know, I go (laughs) rent a mansion. For five hundred bucks. Thank you, but because I'm in LA, it's expensive. So you could say I was in between homes, but I wasn't because in between homes means I have a home, and I'm in between going into the next home that I also have secured. And and you have a baby at this point. And I have a baby. How old? Yes. He was about five at the time. Okay, so you have... And, you know, that is what what drives me because I I, I just, I got tired of being lied on. I got tired of niggas. I got tired of it all. So I got married and I wanted to just have a baby and see what it was like to just be, to not go to bed hungry every damn night. You know, to be able to not have my friends be jealous of me for bullshit because of my job. You're jealous because of what? Because of a fantasy that some nigga you like has? It's fantasy. It's, It's not real. And I'm too real. So I took a break. I needed a break. And um, I did not know taking a break in Hollywood meant you were have to start all over again from scratch. Well, your break was like five years? Yeah. Okay. And at one point, you had to get food stamps. Yeah. I sure did. 
Me and Regina Hall got food stamps <laughs> a week before I booked um, Towson Television. Me and Regina Hall used to be my roommate. Well, she was my across the hall mate. And um, we went and got food stamps. So food stamps was nothing new to me. Uh, okay. I ain't too proud to, you know, to receive what I put into the community for all the years right. of taxes <laughs> that I paid in the 45 percentile bracket, you know? Right. So food stamps is the, my due plus my unemployment. Okay. And, <laughs> I mean, I'm not familiar with the food stamp process, but you have to. It's actually, very humbling. Did you actually have to go down to yeah, like? Yeah, and people were like, "Hey, <laughs> and you the girl for Friday?" Oh, all right, who boo boo? Look, stay away from the chicken or window five. That bitch ain't shit. She gonna try to give you the lowest amount. Go to, go to the, go. <laughs> so here you are at the food stamp. Humble office, as a motherfucker. Yes. And people are recognizing you. Yes. And I mean, if I needed the food stamps, I'd go unemployment is an actor's best friend. I did not I did not sign up to become a doctor or even a teacher. I signed up to become an actor. That means I have to beg for my living every audition. Every audition I have to go in and I have to force them to want me. That's that's friggin' you know, what the hell? So, you know, I'm thankful that people are still hiring me. You know, it, it's just, it's it's what I signed up for. So yeah. there's no complaining. There's no, I, I can't I can't wait and sit back and say, you know, oh, shoot, I ain't working. I don't know. So I have to diversify. I have to figure out other ways to make sure that my baby gets fed, you know, um, and all I know how to do is act. Wasn't there a situation where you and your husband tried to finance a film? Mm -hmm. And Well, we didn't try to finance a film. What happened was I was on a reality show called Hollywood Divas. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlos King got me out of that situation. I, I had pitched a show through Atlanta about a show called Black Actresses, about five actresses who come together and they create a movie or a television show and in that process we follow their journey and that becomes the show um because i had i have so much product and no outlet i when i was signed with three arts before that debacle i was blessed enough to have a deal at fox you know i was with erwin Stahl, and he took me in handheld into fox i got a pilot you know, at the final hour, the hierarchy at Fox changed. And, you know, Peter Roth, who is now one of my biggest fans at the time, I had knots, blonde knots, and he didn't get me. So he recast me with Rose Jackson, my pilot that I created um, for Fox. And she did it, but it didn't get picked up. She got out the game because she married Big Daddy from Married with Children. So I don't know if any of these names are sounding familiar if you're in 90s trivia. Hmm. Um, so my show didn't get picked up, but I've been through the process. So when I went through the process for the reality show, um, Carlos asked me, you know, who I got along with, who I didn't, and that's how the cast was created. But of course, not knowing the reality game, I didn't know it was created for the pro the purpose of you know drama yeah yeah tension drama yeah exactly so we ladies all wanted the same thing we all had a common goal and that was diversifying our talents we had all been in this industry long enough to know some of us more than others like um countess who was a producer on her show the parkers thanks to the brilliance of monique and you know their team they owned a piece even of the Parkers. So we did our thing. In the midst of doing our thing, um, it was really my thing because I was initially cast. TV One came to me for product. No one else had product. I had about six scripts that I presented to them. One was a witch show. One was, 
you know, gangster chicks. One was a girls group. Another one was uh, just about some chicks and their husbands. I just had like, I, I had six complete scripts and each took a different journey for five women and they chose the one called the White Sisters. So because the script was already written, I they wa- they wanted to use it as fodder for the TV show and, you know, act like blah, 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 blah. But Forrest and I had already written the script. So it was like, okay, well, blah, 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 blah. So we blah, 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 blah. But we didn't know that the world would think that their blah, blah, blah was the truth. And for some reason, and I, and I say some reason, I guess glibly, because... The project, we, Forrest and I, were not given the money. Forrest and I were given the creative power, but not really. I was allowed to be the director. I was not paid to be the director, nor was I paid to act in it. So no contractual agreements had taken place between any of us thus far. So Carlos and Todd, um, Todd... Candy's husband, who was also a producer, Todd negotiated 25 G's for us. Todd got Todd got on that phone and made it happen, baby. Yes, and he got us 25 G's, no contracts attached, to shoot the script, the White Sister. So we did all the blah blah blah, pretended like we hired Forrest. Forrest had already written the thing, you know. So when we wouldn't sell the finished product, which mind you, we, like I said, we didn't get the money. We only got artistic control. That was control over what we shot, but we didn't get control over who was cast as far as, um, the back, like, like, um, the grips. We didn't get to cast production. And I guess that's not get higher production. Mm -hmm. So he hired production and this young man who hired production had a history of issues, you know, and he didn't necessarily put all the funds into the project. So a lot of people weren't paid in the end. I still have kids come up to me like, you know, I was on that set or I did hair or I did makeup and this person was supposed to pay. I never heard from that person, you know. And so by the time the project was finished, there was no money. Mm Mm-hmm. All the money had been misappropriated. So they were looking at me like something was wrong with me. So my boy came in and he got it in the end. He did an edit of it. So the five ladies, myself and the other four ladies, would not look like imbeciles. Because the producer and the one of the ladies who wanted to be a producer and claimed to be a producer had misappropriated all our funds. So... They came to us after the the project is done and TV One comes to Forrest and I and the the man, the young man who put money into us having an edit and the reason why it was able to be viewed. And they offered us $2,500 for all rights. Hmm. Wow. So I don't know much about nothing, but I know that $2,500 is nothing yeah but like i said i'd been down that yellow brick road before when i told you i i did the the deal with fox and i know easy come easy go and sometimes just take the money and make the product and that will jump start your career and i learned that um firsthand from bentley kyle evans my boss on family time who told me a story of how that's what he had to do to get his first project or or that girl um, love that girl on he did it for free the first few episodes he gave away he gave away that shit hit so hard they couldn't pay him enough to do more you know so I had to allow my husband to live that journey on his own and so that's what I did so the next season coming back there was there we have it see people don't like in Hollywood people that have minds they want you to do what they tell you to do and when you don't do that you get penalized so the next season coming back I got portrayed as public enemy number one I was con- considered some kind of liar biblical references that I 
I looked up were misinterpreted. So it looked like even God thought I was a liar. <laughs> it was like um, the ladies all conspired against me and then got scared because they found out that I had the rights to the property because I'd written it and I had and I had proof that I'd written it because I'd submitted it before I even knew who they were. I had submitted projects. And um, they once they realized that, then they tried to come back and, and play both ends and get me to go against the others. So when I remotely thought about doing it because they told me they'd done it, it was just so much mess and so much money and all these numbers being thrown around. And I just screamed and went crazy and said, look, bitches, I'm not playing these money grubby games. Let's be real. And when I went kayfade on reality show, they all ganged up on me and made it seem like they wanted to fight me and kick my ass from Cleveland, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting here like, okay, I'm, if you tell me I'm supposed to be the bad guy, like my husband was like, you know, tell me I'm supposed to be the bad guy, then I won't kayfade on you. Then I'll I'll keep the I'll keep the the image. I I can be a I'm an actor. I can be a damn good villain as as you tried to make me be, you know, my whole career. So I didn't have a problem playing the villain, but don't let me know. I felt like I was on punked all the time. You know, I'd show up and you know, my godmother is a transsexual woman. So I'd show up and it'd be a transsexual woman trying to holler at my husband. Hell yeah, bitch, I'm going to go the fuck off because to me, you just another bitch trying to holler at my motherfucking husband. And then I'd be set up for that shit. I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck? What, I, what a bitch can do to get some love in this bitch? So it was, it was like, what the fuck? Yeah. I felt like, what's his name? Ashton Kutcher was about to jump out of every corner. <laughs> I'd be like, please, what is this reality world? Yeah, so uh... they canceled the show and put a, a hate um, stamp on the White Sisters. And it really affected my career. Like the, the lies that they told about me, um, calling me thirsty. I am thirsty. It says to be so in the Bible. But I'm not, I'm not those things. I'm not the person that they made me out to be, you know, and the people that were doing those things, because I am a child of God, I allowed them to live their lie because it is not, once again, my job to expose. My job is to uplift as a child of God. So I didn't snitch on nobody. I didn't tell nothing. They, they, I don't know, they claim their ancestry means that they got to be uh, up and above board well, whose ancestry doesn't i don't know the ancestry <laughs> that says you be a liar uh, what ancestry is that so i just was like whatever racist so you know i it affected all of our careers and you know when you one bad apple does spoil the whole bunch so as talented as you know some of us are myself and golden we still get that run you know and that's jesus that's god because we we you know and 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 countess and and elise at least she was smart enough to jump ship off top you know but it's it's just sad that some people would rather fail than see you win and i i seem to uh i seem to affect women that way my first project i did a documentary mm -hmm. uh through a, a film company called image entertainment it was a it's called ghost ride the whip it was a documentary about the, the i remember the that woman. the people yeah. yeah i saw that oh thank you and i just remember a white car and the little yeah. kid jumping out yeah yeah, yeah. I saw that. And, uh, you know, I was all excited. Oh, I'm going to have a film project. There was like a, you know, a limited theatrical release right. of it and stuff like that. And I got, you know, a little chunk of money for directing and producing it. Right. And I had to spend months sitting, you know, behind a, a video editor, 
right. putting it all together. Right. And I've never seen a royalty payment since that day. You they, see what I mean? They say they've never they've never recouped, even though it was on Netflix and, and, and so That's, forth. And for me to say yeah. I saw it. Yeah. So and, you know. And and I remember right after that I said, I'm done with this whole Hollywood film T V world. I'm just gonna start this YouTube channel and I'm gonna Smart own you. all my own content. And you know, by Hollywood standards, each of these videos are not going to make very much money, but we're going to own them, and they're going, and we're actually going to get the residuals over time. But yet, and they and, aren't making much money yet, yet, because what you are doing, people are watching. Right. I'm here because, like I said, my big sis Lunell and my mentor Bill Duke. Yeah, who's, you know, who was also on a couple of times, and those people, and maybe me sitting here as well. There is a reason why I'm in movies with people that you see do great things mm -hmm. in this industry. We all have our role to play. And in that sense, I've been blessed to be a giver. You know, I've gotten some of your favorite actresses into this game just simply mentoring and loving. You know, I, I've been able to mentor directors, you know, and Sundance has brought me to to mentor directors and teach them how to communicate with actors and you know some of your my my one of my favorite latest you know people that I was able to touch before they really hit was um Storm Storm Reed and I'm just so proud of everything that she's been able to accomplish since you know coming through me and I, and I don't know if it's the universe and I don't know if it's Hollywood but you know I selflessly give to the next generation and that that makes me happy yeah I mean it, it's it's a tough game yeah and, and you know having gone through one iteration of it you have to be chosen I, I said that Waiting and and to me, the harder part wasn't, you know, okay, I didn't make that much money. Was having to get someone else to approve my ideas and finance my ideas. Only to it, steal them. Yeah, and and to potentially steal them or whatever else. It just Did it, you it have wasn't an me. Agent. No. So now you see. No, I didn't have an agent. I didn't and, have anybody. I was. And in Hollywood, you need an agent, mm. and I I said that earlier. If you want to play with the big dogs, you need an agent, preferably a big dog agent. Um, if you do not have an agent, you will be taken advantage of. And I, but the catch 22 is I had an agent and Fox still kicked me out of my pilot. But my agent, Irwin said, sit tight. You'll get created by, and created by is more strong is stronger than writer or anything else. Hmm. Created by the next one we sell, but I wasn't hearing. I was twenty one. I was headstrong. But that being said, even if you have an agent, you're not always gonna win. But you're gonna win. You're gonna win yeah. simply because you have an agent, and they're going to make sure that you're represented and you see what you deserve yeah. being out here like you and I with a lot of talent, a lot of drive, but no one to say, I'm your agent. I'm going to push you. I'm going to get you that check yet. Yeah. Well, I, I just said, fuck the whole thing. So did and I. And I, I just created my own platform Me too. 11, 11 years later. I own and you're, all, and all you're my own shit. content. And I'm now, yeah. And now these videos, YouTube videos actually make money, you know, a lot more money. And, That's right. and you know, we have a catalog, and I think the coolest part is I get to wake you up every morning. You own your own masters. I own all my own masters, and I wake up in the morning. I decide what I want to do and who I want to do it with. And yeah, a, that's and my And not dream. and not have anyone have to approve it or co-sign it or fund it or For anything me, of that sort. For me, it's about I love your stick to itiveness. Like I don't have time without a team, you know. Two, but I see that you are your team. You know, you you. Well, I have said, a team as well. Yeah, I so have you do like have, ten ten employees. Yeah. Yes, you see. I I have I've been going to public access to live my dreams. Hmm. You know, for me it doesn't matter 
if it's on HBO. I know I have talent and I know the cream rises to the top. So whatever I put out there, if it's properly handled, I know it's going to rise to the top. So I'm yeah. saying that to say I I'm at Pasadena Public Forum Public Access putting my mine out there, but I don't have the time to do it the way I want it to be done. I don't have the time to shoot them like I, I should be to to teach the classes, to do the edits. I'm a one man band. So, you know, I'm still making my money living other people's dreams. So it, it takes it takes balance. And it takes that dedication that you had for you to say, okay, I'm going to focus on just me right now. And mm -hmm. I applaud you for that. Thank you. Well, Paula J. Parker, I definitely appreciate you coming in. Uh, a hell of a story. I want to um, I want to talk about the stuff that I'm going to be in that you guys can check out. Let's talk about it. Um, I'm in a project starring Demetria McKinney. And um, it's called A House Divided. So you guys got to check that out on the UMC. I'm also in um, a movie coming out in New York called Dead Men Can't Talk. Okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's my interview. Uh, Dead Men Can't Talk. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Uh, but I'm not. Yes, I am. Um, so what else? And I have uh, uh, well, the new season of Black Jesus. Black Jesus with Slink, yeah, baby, yeah. and Rusty. That is the best work I the the work the most proud of that I'm most proud of in a long, 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 long time. And I'm I'm really excited for that to come out. And you know, it's been a lot of political stuff, and we're still waiting. So you know. I'm I'm here. I'm still here. And I'm going to be here. I ain't going to war. <laughs> That's what it is. Paula J. Parker. God willing. Appreciate you coming in. Can't wait to see what um, else you got P -J -A -I coming up. P-J-A-I Parker at, and that's for um, Gmail. No, not Gmail. That ain't right for Gmail. Twitter? Twitter. And um, the other one, Instagram. I think it is all three. It's all three. Oops. I think I just gave y'all my e email address. <laughs> By the time all, all types of guys jumping in your, yeah, uh, right. in your emails. Uh, <laughs> They're going to bypass the DMs and go straight to the email. I love you guys. Thanks for listening to my story. I kind of really obviously just went around the edge because I'm like one of these kind of girls. Mm. But I give you just enough to live your life. If you want this dream, it ain't easy. Okay? That's what it is. Till next time. Peace.